The DSB Digital Transceiver 2 from QRP Guys is a good little rig, but it is crystal controlled, which is somewhat limiting. Crystals for 40, 30, and 20 meters come with the kit, but finding crystals for other bands can be difficult or expensive or both. Fortunately, there is an alternative. It's a VFO kit, also from QRP Guys. Hello, I'm not Chuck, and today I'm going to show you how I built the SI 5351A 160 meter through 10 meter VFO kit. The assembly instructions from QRP Guys are very good and are available on their website. You should read them thoroughly since they contain some information that I don't include in this video. I'm going to follow the same sequence as the manual describes on pages 3 and 4. Unlike the transceiver kit, the VFO kit has no coils to wind, so assembly is easy with one exception. The main component is the SI5351A oscillator. It's a surface mount IC in a 10-pin MSOP package and is identified on the schematic and the parts list as U2. Here are some dimensioned drawings of the device. It is small and very difficult to hand solder. The pins are on half millimeter centers and the distance between adjacent pins is about one quarter of a millimeter. When you actually look at the IC, you understand just how small it really is. Normally, this surface mount device would be machine placed on pads that were prepped with the aid of a solder stencil and then soldered in a reflow oven. I have designed and built PCBs for SMDs, used stencils to apply solder paste, and reflowed the boards. It works well but I realize that many of you aren't equipped for that, so I will show you a way to hand solder the SI5351A. It's still not easy, but it does work. You will need a good temperature controlled soldering station equipped with a small clean tip. I use a Hako 936 station set to 380 degrees C. The iron has a T18-D12 chisel tip, which is 1.2 millimeters wide. Additional tools and supplies I'm using include masking tape, a cotton swab, some 90% isopropyl alcohol, a flux pen, a fine pair of curved tweezers, some 6337.02 inch diameter rosin core solder, a pair of small flush cut wire cutters, and some 2 millimeter or 3 millimeter wide solder braid. To start, I tape the printed circuit board to a heavy piece of sile stone with rubber feet on the bottom. For surface mount components, I don't need access to the bottom of the PCB, and taping the board down this way keeps it from sliding around as I work on it, and yet still allows me to rotate the board as needed. This rotation may be a little disorienting on the video, but it really helps during the actual soldering process, and I wanted to show it. Cleaning the PCB with an alcohol dipped swab removes any oil or other contaminants that might interfere with soldering. The other end of the swab can help remove the alcohol as it dries. Fluxing the pads improves the chances the solder will flow well and adhere well. The SI5351A chip has 10 pins. Pin 1 is designated by the round indentation on the case at the top left. Pins 1 through 5 are on the left and pins 6 through 10 are on the right with pin 6 at the bottom right. Positioning the IC on the pads is a little fiddly, but can be done with patience and a few retries. Once the pins are all in contact with the correct pads, I use the tweezers to hold the IC in place while I apply a dab of solder 
to the upper right corner pins. This solder dab will hold the IC while I work on the other side. Next, I apply solder to pins 1 through 5, and at this point, I don't worry about any solder bridges that I make. After rotating the PCB again, I repeat the process with pins 6 through 10. To remove the solder bridges, I use some clean solder braid that has been fluxed. I try to heat all five pins on a side, and when I see the solder being wicked into the braid, I slide the braid off and the solder bridges come with it. I cut off the used portion of the solder braid and follow the same process on the other side of the IC. At this point I do an inspection of all the pins. I want to be sure that every pin is soldered to its respective pad and there are no solder bridges between pins. Again I use isopropyl alcohol on a cotton swab to clean away the flux residue. In this photo, you can see that my soldering job is not perfect. The IC is off-center to the left, but not enough to be a problem. Pins 1 through 5 look good, but pins 6 through 10 could certainly be better. They're not perfectly aligned with their pads, and pin 6 looks like it might not even be soldered to the pad. It's also too close to pad 7. Fortunately, when I look it over with a jeweler's loop, it checks out okay. A quick look at the schematic also shows that pin 6 is not used in the VFO circuit, so it really doesn't matter if it is soldered to the pad or not, just so it doesn't touch the pin 7 pad. My pedantic nature causes me to want to pretty it up, but my practical side tells me to leave well enough alone, which I do. If it turns out to be a problem during functional testing, 
I'll address it then. Once U2 is in place, next up are the diodes. Diodes are polarized and must be installed with the rings on the devices on the same side as the bars on the silk screen printed on the PCB. The bars represent the cathodes and are the negative ends. The other ends are the anodes and are the positive ends. Then come the resistors, which are not polarized and can be installed either way around. I like to orient them all with the gold bands either to the right or to the bottom. There are two crystals to be installed and they are not polarity sensitive. However, they are two different values, 16 megahertz and 25 megahertz, and must be installed in the correct locations. Some capacitors are polarized and some aren't. In this assembly, there is only one polarized capacitor, C3. The negative lead is identified on the case of the cap and the positive lead is the longer of the two. Lay the cap on its side on the PCB. The remaining capacitors are not polarized, but you should be careful not to confuse the two different values. At this point, it's time to install the socket for the 28-pin microcontroller, and it goes on the bottom of the PCB. However, once it's installed, there will be no access to the leads for the 16 MHz crystal, so double-check the crystal before you solder the socket in place. Be sure the notch on the socket is on the same end as the notch on the silkscreen drawing. Solder all 28 leads in place and watch out for solder bridges. The pins are close to other components and it's easy to bridge two pins together. Next is the five digit seven segment display. Of course it goes on the front of the PCB and will fit only one way. Make sure it is flat against the PCB before you start soldering. Cut off the excess leads after soldering. Switches S1, S2, and S3 are identical, but there is a right and a wrong orientation. Make sure you put them in correctly and solder all four leads on each switch. The instructions advise trimming the leads flush after soldering, so don't neglect that. I will explain why a bit later. U3 is a 3-pin, 5-volt regulator IC, even though it looks like a transistor. Match the shape of the IC to the silk screen drawing on the PCB. And last, install U1, the 28-pin microcontroller, in the socket on the bottom of the PCB. Note that you will likely need to bend all the pins on U1 slightly toward the center of the IC before it will fit into the socket. Be sure to locate the notch on the end of the IC with the notch on the end of the socket. That's all we have time for today. Next time I'll cover the testing and installation of the VFO on the DSB transceiver 2. Don't forget, I'm not Chuck.